history of organizing across the United States. And I currently serve as senior field representative for Congresswoman Karen Bass, chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus and Africa Subcommittee. I am joined by a distinguished panel of public and private sector leaders, activists, and political and African enthusiasts who will briefly introduce themselves, starting with Rahiel Tesfamarian. Hello, everyone. Happy Africa Day. And to all my Eritrean uh, fellow citizens, a happy Independence Day. Um, my name is Rahel Tesfamarian. I was born as Mother Eritrea, uh, raised in the South Bronx in Washington, D.C. Um, just came back from living on the continent for three years, doing pan African solidarity work in South Africa. Uh, my background is largely in media, youth advocacy, and I'm also a minister, so uh, public theology as well. Thank you for that. Let's kick it over to Adebola Williams in Nigeria. Hi, my name is Ade Bola Williams, and I am CEO for Red. Red is a group of media companies. Uh, I think that uh, today I'm here in the capacity of Statecraft Inc., our governance, communication, and nation building company. Thank you. Constance Moonsway, please take it away. Hey, everybody. Happy Africa Day. Um, so, I'm originally from Zambia. I'm based in Los Angeles and I am the executive director of RSMC and we are an executive search firm and we basically provide executive level individuals to Fortune 100 and above companies. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, Andum Jebro Georgis. Perfect. Great pronunciation. Thank Happy you. Africa every day, everyone. What's up? My name is Andam Gebre Georgis. I'm from Mount Vernon, New York. Uh, my family is originally from Eritrea as well. And I'm a, by profession, I've been a special education teacher for most of my career. I'm now running for Congress here in New York, uh, in Southern Westchester, North Bronx. Thank you all for those brief, the key is brief introductions. I'd just like to start by saying last year was dubbed the year of return, and we saw a record number of historic and contemporary members of the African diaspora convened on continental Africa for a series of events rooted in the spirit of celebrating home. This year, we recognize that it has been 60 years since 17 African countries received their independence in 1960, which is dubbed the year of liberation. To that effect, I'd be remiss if I did not wish all of my Eritreans a happy belated Independence Day. <laughs> Our segment is African leadership and politics. We'll be underscoring opportunities and challenges with achieving an Africa that works for all 1.2 billion and counting inhabitants and its diaspora. We know that we are home to the country with the most women in parliament. We're the breadbasket of the world with 60% of the world's arable land and 1.2 billion inhabitants where the majority are able-bodied young people between the ages of 15 and 26. We have an abundance of natural raw resources and the list goes on. To say the least, for Africa to maximize its potential, good leadership is imperative. Today we will discuss increasing activism and participation in the voting process on the continent, the rise of strong men, and the battle of political ideology on the continent. Leaders coming together to support free trade and the development of private sector, as well as government's response to COVID-19 and so much more. I would like to kick it off with you, Andrew. By 2040, we know that Africa will be home to nearly 500 million young people between the ages of 15 and 24, if not more. For these young people and those that are younger, education is the foundation for which we will build future leaders of tomorrow. Institutions such as Ashesi University, the African Leadership Academy, and Leadership University are on the front lines of education, creating a springboard for our leaders of tomorrow. My question to you is, and everyone is welcome to chime in, 
What are some key values and principles that can be taught in schools to instill a moral compass that guides decision making? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think that when we're looking at education, uh, a lot of times there's a, a premium and a focus put on character values and, and character traits. Um, here in the States, there's sometimes a problematic racial dimension that is associated with that. Um, but I think when we look at the continent, you know, when we think of things like grit and empathy, I think so much of that is already uh, natural to our, our cultures and um, particularly when we think of community building and, and what happens in, in local communities within, on the continent, we see that already uh, happening within, uh, within the framework of, of, of people's culture. And so I think when I think about education on the continent, one of the things that for me is really the issue is ensuring that there are positive returns to investments in education. That means that there's connections to education and employment, that actually investing time, money, and energy in a college degree will lead to um, positive returns down the road. So I don't, I don't worry so much as, about you know, the, the, the character values and the sort of uh, uh, moral compass around uh, decision making. I, I worry about that there's positive returns to investments in education and that has to do with capacity building and ensuring that there are ties between education and employment. Okay. Would anyone else like to have a piece of that pie? I mean, I think that when we look at education, it, I, I think there has to be a high focus on technology. I mean, I think if this pandemic has taught us anything is how quickly technology can change and evolve. And I think uh, Africa as a continent, when we look at education, it's really to focus in on those uh, things that give the African people upper, en uh, upper edge. And I think that the investment in technology like blockchain, for example, or artificial intelligence, for example, I think could be things that could really help um, the younger generation really get above and like sort of move ahead. Yeah, and I, I wanna add to that, that, I mean, I think it's important to look at the fact that the rest of the world doesn't study Africa, but Africa is forced to study the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You have an entire generation of young people who are learning about countries that are foreign to their own reality. They learn about the West, about Britain, about Canada. Um, I, my husband tells me all the time, they knew the name of rivers in Canada. How does that relate to the language in the world, right? And so a large part of it is that they're not getting the political history of Africa. And in order for them to truly be cultivated into the next generation of leaders, they have to know the history of colonization. They have to know the schools of liberation from folks like Patrice Lumumba and Kwame Nkrumah. What was the role of socialist thinking in Africa? Um, what has been you know, the role of capitalism in shaping Africa? So that they can form a political ideology uh, one rooted in transformation and liberation of the continent, not simply gazing at America and, and European powers through social media, they constantly want to come closer and closer to American culture, which is the threat that we have, you know, that they have more access to, to American and, and European culture than ever before. And in many ways, they're just absorbing that culture and not focus on the continent itself. That was powerful. I think everyone has captured it. Just, just to put some clarity onto what Rahim said, uh, um, you know, uh, I would say, you know, aside from teaching empathy, integrity, honesty, kindness, compassion, which you did say are kind of peculiar to us already. But it's interesting that even though we're supposedly kind people, empathetic people, when we get into office, you do not see that. There's a disconnect somewhere. A disconnect where the kindness and the empathy that you find amongst communities is not reflected when the same group of people ascend leadership. Then it becomes me and my friends. It becomes a lot of TV and it becomes lack of development for the country. So, so, so in the middle of that, I think the bridge is to to, 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 to write on what Rahiela said, which is to teach them not just, you know, uh, 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 about Kwame and Co, but to actually teach them a sense of identity, a sense of their culture, 
to make them own the story, to make them own the fact that this nation belongs to me. And if ever tomorrow I become, you know, positioned to be able to grow my country, I will do it. I will not become a governor tomorrow, a mayor tomorrow, and I turn it to me and my friends. So there is a disconnect there. I used to say for a long time that Nigeria gave me nothing. I would say it on stages when I speak around the world, from Europe to America. And one day I stopped and I said, no, Nigeria gave me problems. And I chose to solve those problems. And in solving those problems, I became a trailblazer and I'm being celebrated around the world. But if Nigeria did not give me something to work with, I wouldn't have been able to create a trail for myself. So I changed the narrative for myself. And that's why I continue to remain committed to Nigeria and to Africa. So something important to teach our children is what is the thing that makes them love their countries passionately and serve their country at every point in time. So technology will accelerate. If you look at our continent, many of our countries are behind on technology because the leaders do not truly love the country, do not truly love the people, not truly committed. So all the funds, all the resources that should be used to accelerate this country, this country by technology, or that should be used to even give basic education, is being spent in a small circle. So what Mr. Williams, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. I, I have something that is going to allow you to expand upon your idea, but I want to keep the conversation flowing and fluid, right? So don't go anywhere. I'm coming, right? So for you, and I, I, I want to start with you and then punt this to the rest of our panelists. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation is fighting for significant gains in leadership in Africa. This foundation is using the Ibrahim Index of African Governance to measure excellence in governance for heads of state. Laureates include the likes of Modiba Mandela, Liberation leader and former president of South Africa, and Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, the former president of Liberia. Upon leaving office, leaders received five billion over 10 years and a 200K award towards the charity of their choice. Critics underscore that the Abraham Foundation retroactively awards leaders for doing their job and that it doesn't go far enough to ensure that leaders are good stewards of public office while they serve. And I know you just hinted at the fact that it becomes me and my friends once these individuals are in office. So my question to the panelists, starting with you, Mr. Williams, what are some actions that people can take to help keep leaders honest while they are in office? I think, you know, first is to accept that there's an accountability gap in leadership on the continent. And to also accept that there's an accountability part on the follower side. There is something we call the office of the citizen, you know, in our activities and activism here in Nigeria. It is the highest office in the land, the office that puts a president in office, the office that holds the leaders from governors to mayors to everyone accountable. The moment the citizens fail to express and own their office, they allow the leaders to get away with murder. So it's a two-pronged approach. I see governors on the continent as a group of people who have entrusted their resources to a group of contractors. These contractors are supposed to build your home. But because of the history of the continent, you have seen contractors disappear with resources. So if you do not go to sites, you might not see them. They will not build your house. If you do not check the site, do not check the brick, do not check the cement, you will not see your building. So I think the biggest thing that people can do is to take seriously their job of holding the leaders accountable, not just once, not just twice, but consistently end to end. So I say, for example, to people in Nigeria, who is your council? Who is your chairman? Who is your member of house? Who is your senator? Because before you attack the president for lack of performance, there are many other people who should have delivered your road, your health care, among other things. But many times, the citizens fail to know this. Thing. They don't pay attention. They don't write letters, they don't protest to their counselors and their representatives. 
So I think the biggest gap is the accountability gap, both on the part of the leaders and the part of the followers. Okay, thank you. Um, Rahel, would you like, uh, you, you have that look in your eye, like you're ready to dive on in. Yeah, like ready to jump in. Um, yeah, well, one, I mean, we have to be honest that power is going to corrupt, right? So uh, who they were in a freedom struggle and who they were at a moment in which they were trying to gain um, liberation for their country is very different than who they become over time. Once they have access to power, money, resources, influence, um, so one, we have to know that that role inherently almost cultivates uh, corruption. And, and I say that to say the people have to have, have to have honesty in themselves about the reality they're dealing with. Because oftentimes they live in this nostalgia of who got them into, into the position of leadership, you know, into the position of liberation. And they hold on to that nostalgia to the point that it could be 20 or 30 years down the line. And they're still saying, well, we wouldn't be free today if it wasn't for so-and-so, right? We got to let go of the nostalgia. So it does begin with the people, the people saying that just because this you know, group, this guerrilla group, this party or this individual helped bring us to liberation doesn't mean that they are eternally uh, free to do whatever the hell they want to do. Right. So we have to hold them accountable. Part of what accountability looks like is formation of media. And why that's so important is because one of the biggest things that dictators try to minimize is freedom of the press. And they do that not just because it leads to education of the masses, right? So that once people are reading about their conditions and empowered to do something about it, not only that, but international perception. If you use South Africa as a case in point, you know, apartheid shifted when the international community responded and said something has to change. Where does that come from? International press and understanding of the situation, right? So we have to start having grassroots. Uh, media outlets created, teaching our young people how to cultivate press, you know, and not just state run media. Of course, that goes with um, human rights. I mean, at the end of the day, people are limited in what they can do if they face imprisonment, if they face either, uh, torture, as in some cases in like my own country. So what we have to have is an international community where we're not leaving them alone to the wolves. The human rights of Africa matters just as much as it does Palestine or any other country that we're fighting for. And unfortunately, the international community, such as African Americans in the United States, oftentimes don't have a personal interest in the affairs of Africa the way that we do other countries. So part of it is also the global community's responsibility to take a greater interest in affairs of our continent. Thank you. Um, and I would like to shift gears a little bit because I know when we're talking about um, global powers or po Western powers for that matter, um, many of these countries had a role to play in the colonization of the continent. Um, and for the sake of that, I would like to speak a bit about um, Pan-Africanism. We all know that there were a series of Pan-African Congresses, I think the fifth one in which was held in Manchester, UK, where there were delegates from the Afro diaspora, the, they were delegates from the continent. And this Congress was touted as the event that ushered in a new age of leadership for Africa, with attendees vying for independence and post-colonial African governance. I think we witnessed the likes of um, Jomo Kenyatta from Kenya, W.E.B. Du Bois from the United States, Hastings Banda from Malawi, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Dudley Thompson, from Jamaica, uh, Bafemi Awolowa, Jaja Wachukul, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and the question would be like, how can we address the notion that colonialism or colonization created the Africa as we know it today, and that there isn't much that Africans on the continent or in the diaspora can do to improve our own circumstances? So we talked about accountability. We've talked about a whole host of these other things, but I do believe to a great extent that lines have dictated a majority of how history has turned out. So do you think, one, I want to repeat the question, do you think that there is something that we as a diaspora can do and Africans on the continent can do to improve our circumstances? And do you think that redrawing territory lines would lead to improved outcomes? 
Uh, well, I I think that united. It's kind of like that cliche: united, we 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 have to be united as a continent. I mean, when we look at colonialism and what has happened in the past, those were arbitrary lines that were cast upon our continent. But we we are one people, and I think the sooner we get to that realization, and the sooner we work together as one people, not you know not Ethiopians and Zambians and Nigerians and all that, we have to really unite as a continent. And the more advanced we get to that cause, I think that's when we're going to really start to see change. I mean, each African country is too small to really change the entire continent. We really have to be united. And it's good to see that we're starting there. You know, we're starting to see the borders open up. We're starting to see free trade open up between African countries, and that's a good thing. And I think we need to continue to move towards that direction because that's what the continent uh, needs. We've been too divided, whether it be from, you know, whether we were colonized like by the British, like in Zambia, or if you're colonized by the French or the Dutch, we're, we've been too divided. And I think that we have to unite in order for us to really achieve the goals that we need to achieve as a continent. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that for many of us, particularly in, in the diaspora, um, the concept of borders is something that in itself is already malleable. You know, we exist between multiple worlds um, and, you know, connecting with what Rahel was talking about, you know, uh, especially as Eritreans, there are just so many dimensions to um, what we consider the, the typical sort of binary around European power versus African sort of colonized. You know, there are internal dynamics that we have to recognize uh, while seeing the benefits of solidarity of us as a continent and, and one people, but also recognize the differences that um, exist not only historically, but, but ethnically, religiously, and honor those differences and, and create space to, to allow those differences to, to be beautiful and not something that's divisive. I think as someone in the diaspora connecting it to the previous question around accountability, when we think about accountability in a political sense, so much of it uh, has to do with like democratic transitions, right, and, and elections. For many of us in our countries, right, that's not a, that's not a reality. Um, and so what is the way in which we can hold our, our governments accountable? Uh, what is the sort of rational expectation that they'll have that people, that if they do something that's not to the benefit of the people, that there will be a consequence? And I think that, you know, many people are talking about tech uh, and the way that we can use social media to, to unite us. Um, I think that there are interesting ways in which we can even think about pan-Africanism uh, in a tech space that maybe didn't exist before. Um, so I think there are a whole host of ways to do it, but I think around the concept of borders, I think borders are shifting not necessarily in the sense of uh, uh, you know what Constance was talking about with it opening, even though I agree with that. I think just in the terms of the fact that by 2050, 25 percent of the world's population is going to is, is going to be African, and many of us are spread around throughout the world. Whether it's because of climate change, whether it's because of war, whether it's just because we want to, we're born somewhere else. Um, so I think the concept of borders will be is already changing. Can I just make one quick point um, about our tribalism and the fact that we've internalized a lot of racism within ourselves, um, how we often look at which African country, which African culture is better than another, whether it's based on, you know, uh, appearances and physical features. Like there's a lot of colorism. There's a lot of racism, even in my own culture. You know, you, you find that a lot of Eritreans and Ethiopians will not marry outside mm -hmm. of the context, right? And, and it's not a coincidence, we call it pride, but a lot of it is also a form of racism that we've adopted from internalizing this self-hatred for centuries, right? So I think part of it is the internal work and the undoing of trauma also that we have to do where we've come to believe the, the lies that white supremacy has sold right. us about one another, that we look for which country is more savage than the other, and, mm -hmm. and we pride ourselves if we're more developed so if we're really talking about defeating this notion of colonization and the borders, the borders start with our minds and we're passing them on to our children. And so it, part of it is it, grooming a generation that doesn't see Africa in the same unhealthy ways that our parents did. Um, Mr. Williams, I have I just, this question. Go, go for it. Did you, you wanna, yeah. did you wanna join on that? Yeah, I just want to jump in quickly, um, um, you know, because when, when, I mean, it, it talking colonization, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the mind, it's the head, you know, and there might need to be a lot more work done by us on the Africa storytelling, the Africa storytelling, 
We need to tell our children, we need to tell ourselves how great we are, how great our fathers were, how we were the kings, how they came to bow to us, then they stole from us, then they turned it around and took over our lands. You know, so we need to deconstruct the stories of the continent and the stories of the countries, you know, and so we need to work on the minds, you know, um, we see we see BET and a number of these platforms are trying to tell the African story, but they are still not African story. They're still not our story. We need our own platforms. And you know, finally, we need to realize that social media has democratized storytelling. And every one of us on this video, and everyone watching us, with your 1,000 followers, 500, 200,000, 1 million, you are a moving television, a moving billboard. So we should educate ourselves and be able to pass on the education to our parents and to our children. For us to break free from colonialism, which is basically a state of play inferior, to move to a place of innovation, invention, creation, to see ourselves as scientists and so on and so forth, we need to change the mindset of our people. And that will start from everything we can do with this item, as well as television and radio. Thank you. That was, um, thank you for those responses. Um, I would like to punt this one um, in the air, and whoever would like to catch it can feel free to do so. In March of 2018, Chinese lawmakers removed presidential term limits, effectively allowing for President Xi Jinping to rule the country indefinitely. Given the extent of Chinese influence on the continent, and the history of political ideology battles between democracy and socialism. How do you see these changes to term limits impacting leadership in Africa? I mean, I think that term limits are always dangerous, right? I mean, I, 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 I think that it's complicated, right? I mean, when you look at our founding founders, a lot of our presidents ruled for many, many years and were successful. Um, but I don't think that a president should rule indefinitely because it it's a breeding ground of corruption. It's a breeding ground for so many different things. I think that power is in change. And as we grow as a country, new leadership is formed by the kids who are growing up right now. So I, I don't think that that would be a good strategy for Africa in general. I, I, I do like the American uh, model of you know, that eight year max, I think that that is a good strategy. And I think that that should be implemented throughout the continent, personally, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's really understanding your nation. Um, every country is peculiar with, you know, their style, the people, I and mean, how their leaders over time have responded. If we look at how we leaders on the continent have responded over time, then let's ask ourselves, is a limitless, termless presidency good for the continent or not? It's for us to basically adapt. That's why we talk about you know, adaptation, about culture, about identity. When you understand your own culture, your identity, when you're rooted in your own ways and your system, then you take global best practices and you adapt to your identity. You adapt to your existing system. You know, it might be foolhardy for us to decide to do limitless terms on the continent based on what we have seen in the past. If we get into a space where our leaders suddenly become so visionary, so efficient, so impactful, you know, the leaders in China and Dubai, you can see that they truly care about their nation. They are truly hell-bent on making their nation the best in the world. You can see that, you know. so. For you to earn the trust, where I do not need to put any shackles around you, no prenups, no, you know, we don't even need to sign anything about our marriage. Just listen, take my resources and run with it. You need to earn the trust. And the trust will come from your actions over time. And based on our current situation on the continent, this is one of the few accountability, you know, uh, things that we have to, to keep our leaders in check. So. It might it will take a little while before we get to a limitless leadership. Well, uh, I'll let you go, and I just want to say something quickly after you. 
Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, you know, I think when we look I'm at really how- worried about abandonment, abandonment. What happened? No, no, never, never. Um, you know, when we see the agenda that China has had on the continent for you know last two decades, especially, um, we see that there has not been political conditionality with the economic support that they've given. Um, and so, you know, for many rulers who are especially authoritarian, that can be beneficial. You know, they get their economic support, they get infrastructure aid, there is labor to be exploited. But especially when we're looking at the ways in which those paths of development are seen as models for rulers, um, th this case in which, uh, uh, you know, t taking away the term limits, it's, it's not a model that's beneficial for the actual African people uh, if we're looking at China as a model for, for development, which many countries have. I think when we're talking about, you know, the politics of non-interference, which China has largely had on the continent, um, you know, it's allowed for human rights abuses to continue and, and to exacerbate situations which already were pr pr problematic to begin with. Connecting it with the previous question that was, we're talking about colonialism, you know, we need to think about the type of interactions foreign actors have on the continent. You know, Rahul's exactly right around the borders, uh, are, the colonialism's in our mind, the border is in our mind. But at the same time, there's also neocolonialism and agro-imperialism and actual economic factors that are taking root on the continent, which are not building capacity for indigenous actors and are allowing the exploitation of our land and labor. So those are just things that we need to keep in mind as we move forward. Yeah, a conversation about the role of China on the continent is its own separate summary. Right. And we could talk right. about <laughs> right. so the economy and all of that yeah. centered on China and possibly also yeah. China. But uh, if we set that aside for a second, I would say that we don't really need to imagine what a, a leadership in Africa looks like with indefinite term limits. I think we only have to look at history. We could look at Eritrea. We look, look at Zimbabwe, for example. Uh, there are countless examples on the continent of what happens when you let leaders rule indefinitely. Oftentimes you find that there is either mass corruption or mass suppression. Because what happens is that when you amass that type of power and wealth over time, there's no way that after a while, the end goal doesn't simply become maintaining power at all costs. And once that's the end goal, the people will suffer. And so you look at these situations where political leaders become corrupt and their sole focus is on maintaining power. And as a result, you find foreign nations imposing sanctions on those countries. And who suffers from those sanctions? The people, right? And so the US and, and Britain and whoever always has their own individual interests in these countries. And so they decide, this person is no longer serving our needs. So what are we going to do? Impose sanctions. And by doing that, you have starvation. You have the people unemployed. And so I have yet to see an example of this where it works well. And honestly, from like a spiritual and theological standpoint, there is no human being set up and designed to have power at that level for that amount of time without it affecting us in a negative way. Our level of narcissism is insane if we think that people can rule for a lifetime and that it's going to serve the common interest. It's impossible. So we have to create a communal system of accountability. Now, you could also look at South Africa as an example of you could have turnover, you could have change in leadership, but the same party stays in place for decades and decades. And you have other parties that arise and create alternatives, but no mechanism is in place for anybody else to win, just like the United States two-party system. So ultimately, I would advocate for the capacity for leadership to shift with the needs of a country. Indefinite term limits never allows that to happen. And just to jump in real quick, sorry, don't want to just, just, you know, because you were talking before about the liberatory nostalgia. Yeah, real quick, the, the, the liberatory nostalgia um, that we have for many of our rulers, which allows for, you know, just sort of dictatorship to persist. And I think it's very important within our own organizations, whether it's a guerrilla movement, a, liber a liberation organization, a, a you know, a nonprofit, whatever kind of organization that we have that we prevision uh, and prefigure the society that we want within our own organizational structure. There is nothing, you know, if you look at the Eritrea example, yeah, it makes sense to have sort of a, 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 a austere, ascetic Marxist organization as a guerrilla front. And then you're going to say, we're just going to transition all of a sudden into a democracy. It doesn't work that way. You know, you have to have these, uh, these systems in place and structures in place within your own organization. Thank you. <clears throat> brilliantly articulated you all um, I just want to keep the ball rolling and um, 
to each of you, I would like to ask, um, probably starting with Constance, what are some sectors that political leaders can reform to improve daily life for those living on the continent and why, really quickly? I mean, agriculture, number one. I mean, when you look at East Africa, we're being invaded by locusts. You know, we, we're focusing on the uh, coronavirus. Yes, that's important. And that's definitely impacting our continent. But agriculture is the one sector when, we one, we can feed ourselves so we can fight starvation. Two, we can export. Uh, and so I think that there needs to be a doubling down. I love what the World Food Bank is doing in terms of buying back from our commercial farmers and bringing revenue into the continent. So hands down, I think that it's agriculture where the leaders need to really double down because we have the natural resources to do so. Okay. Um, Rahel? Honestly, I struggle with this question because um, I can't really think of a sector where, where uh, you know, assistance and help and, and resources are not needed. Um, the number one focus for me is oftentimes rooted in land, uh, largely because when you look at the continent, um, a lot of a lot of the instability is, is, is tied to, to housing. Um, and when you talk about agriculture, agriculture is directly tied to land ownership, right? So, so much of the continent is in this problematic place where, you know, we, we don't own large parts of the land. Um, and so I think until, and I, and I, I do see EF, EFX probably more so than any other political entity on a continent is pushing this conversation. But, you know, how do we really reclaim power um, and, and any sense of growth on a continent? without actually owning the land, without it not being parceled off by Japan and China and whatever European entities remain or France or whoever it may be. Because any other conversation, whether it's technology or natural resources, goes back to land, whether it's copper in Zambia or wherever, you know, who owns the land and has access to it, um, controls agriculture, controls technology, controls the economy. So until we get to a place where we can really reclaim our land, everything else becomes impossible. Thank you. Debola. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll say sectors that our governments need to begin to pay attention to. I'll say technology first. Um, I think that, you know, um, uh, for us to accelerate the continent, we need to catch up and we need to also support. You know, I like to say to many young people that if the internet is not making money for you, it's taking money from you. And many things on the continent, if we didn't take from us, we're not creating on the platform. We're not making, you know, we're not making the founders money. We're basically feeding off, you know, so we need to change the way we interact with technology from primary to secondary level, where our young people can adapt faster and they can begin to then create and invent, you know, the Ubers, the Slacks, the Microsoft Teams, the WhatsApp, and all of these platforms that are created, and we always end up being data and marketing points on them. I also think that entertainment, arts, culture, that whole space of tourism needs to be looked into closely. Entertainment is one of the biggest employers on the continent, especially in Nigeria, where Nollywood is big. Nollywood has become the second largest film industry in the world. And these are quick, you know, most of them quick, bootleg, you know, type films. And then you have the newer producers like the Moabudus who are doing the global type, you know, films that can play anywhere in the world. But these guys are crossing, you know, I mean, in the last, in the last two years, they've gone from, you know, barely making maybe about, about 50K to grossing a million dollars in the last two years. Imagine what can happen. If, you know, the government actually focuses on those industries. I walk on the streets of Senegal and I see the young people, their hair plated, their jeans, you know, gypsy. Everyone is very creative, very into art. Ghana made a whooping $1.9 billion injected in their economy, courtesy of the year of return. Just a couple of months, you know, of concerts and coming to find your identity and yourself. So imagine that model is replicated in different countries. You know, so technology is a big enabler, and we need that urgently. I, I tell people that the pandemic basically just forced us into where we could be. It just accelerated us into where we're supposed to go eventually. And now we need to expand our base to technology, and then entertainment, 
and culture. You know, those are those are those are big money spinners that our governments need to focus on. And you know, many of them don't even understand it. That's why they need a lot of young people around them, credible, smart young people. You know, who can help help them guide you know their steps into into these two two spaces. And I'm thinking yeah. I'll, I'll be very quick. Land, land, labor, water, Wi-Fi. That's what we need. Land, labor, water, and Wi-Fi. Thank you, sir. Um, before we conclude, we have two questions. The next one being, <clears throat> we see that COVID-19 has taken a hold on the continent. And you all knew I couldn't let this conversation go any further without talking about this pandemic. How do you view African leadership during COVID-19, which countries have had the best responses? And do you think that lessons from pandemics such as AIDS and HIV, Ebola, have led to improved responses from African leaders? Um, well, Senegal has done incredible, right? Senegal, I think for me, has had the best response from their $1 testing kits to their $60 in, uh, um, sort of uh, intubation devices that they've made. I mean, I think Senegal has had the best, second to best response even uh, beyond the United States and Europe. I think that Ebola and AIDS has prepared Africa well for this pandemic. And, you know, I know that a lot of critics are saying that, oh, we're going to see a spike. I don't think we're going to see that significant uh, of a spike in on the continent in general. I think in general, our, our uh, the continent has responded very well. And Senegal being my, I think, top priority, uh, like my number one position in terms of their response. If we don't have any more takers, we don't need more takers. But if anyone else would like to, I can I can jump in quick. I mean, I don't I don't know how all of the the countries on the continent have have been responding. But speaking generally, I think you know uh, countries next to to DRC um, with the Ebola outbreak they had in 2018. You know, I know from what I've read about Rwanda, Burundi, I think they've done a good job with sort of rapid response teams, uh, contact tracing, isolation. Um, definitely Senegal and Ghana from, from what I've heard, but you know, I think the level of coordination that's been happening just because of already having those systems in place uh, from, from Ebola outbreaks in the past, it seems like it's been uh, really good. Uh, just a quick point, we shouldn't forget that the countries that have the highest numbers, South Africa and East, are the ones also with the highest tourism. Um, so, it, so when we look at the numbers, it's kind of also hard to just make any claims about who's doing well and who's doing poorly, partly because, um, you know, the, the, the amount of, of tourists that were coming into the country initially when this first started, uh, you had masses that would come, of course, as you know, into, say, South Africa and Egypt, where, you know, uh, places like, uh, you know, Eritrea, for example, are not going to have a lot of tourists, right? Um, so I think that should just be factored in. But the key point about COVID is that uh, African nations cannot think that they can just uh, adopt the ways of, of the United States by telling people to quarantine indefinitely. Uh, you got to feed folks, you got to provide adequate um, resources because a lot of people on the continent live day by day wages, not even week by week. So if you think that people are going to be able to quarantine in and shut down for, you know, indefinitely, you're, you're going to starve people to death. And then you find yourself in, in a completely different crisis. Right. And can I add to that? I think that that's a really good point because I don't think as a continent COVID is what we need to be worried about. We need to worry about starvation. You know, as people are being quarantined, they can't go out, they can't earn a living. There's not stimulus packages and checks being spread around. I mean, people need to eat. And, you know, you have to think about it. The African, the average African is 19 years old. And so if we look at COVID, you know, COVID historically is you know, attacking people who are older, have other comorbidities. We need to look at this from a hunger crisis issue. Like and that's the way I'm looking at it with locusts attacking in East Africa with isolation and quarantine 
going on in South and Central Africa, and people are not being fed. So people are dying more of hunger. And another thing that we haven't addressed on this platform is because we're isolating, children are not being vaccinated. So you're having kids who are not being vaccinated against TB, polio, measles. These are all things that can re-emerge within our continent. So I feel like COVID is sort of masking some of these larger pandemic issues that we we should be really concerned about. Thank you. I've just got to say that, you know, on, on I mean, in Nigeria, you know, um, I've been I've been really proud of the citizens. Um, and with some stories I've heard as well from Zimbabwe to Kenya. Um, on the side of social interventions, I've got good reports from South Africa, you know, from my friends. But, you know, we set up a website. You all can please check it out beatingcorona.africa. Um, it was beatingcorona.ng and we just evolved to beatingcorona.africa because we're expanding on the continent. And it's basically captured the interventions, you know, all the interventions that come up, you know, to fill the gap for, for, the, for the failings of government or whatever it is, you know, in this season. Basically showing Nigerians for Nigeria, Ghanaians for Ghanaians, South Africans for South Africans, you know, the whole Africa for Africa. And I've been most inspired at how, you know, COVID has force the people to again re reignite that community spirit of helping one another. And I think that one narrative that we must not lose, because at the end of the day, all our conversation is built on having better leadership, is that we must remind our people who stood for them in this time of crisis. It was the people. And so we must ensure that when the next election comes, our citizens must ask the right questions. When those who were in office, when this pandemic came, and there was no solution for them. You must ask them, how did you prepare us? Why did you fail? And not reward them by putting them back in office. These are conversations that every one of us here must be able to carry on our social media platforms and everywhere we go. The people must remember that when the whole nation was shut down, when the world was shut down, where government couldn't escape and evacuate as they always do, the only people that really came through for them were their fellow citizens, and that's an important narrative in rebuilding Africa, you know, and keeping through from community action to national development. Thank you. That was, um, thank you for reminding us of our civil duties. And that was also a great call to action. To conclude, I would like to play the one word game. Without describing the leaders from this country as corrupt or evil, I would like you to use just one word to describe them because I'm always interested in hearing how people describe leaders from around the country and we're gonna go from around the continent. We're gonna go ahead and play two rounds of this. Um, Rahil, Kwame Nkrumah. Prophetic. Adebola, Mobutu Seseko Kuku, Bendu Wazabanga. Really, Dila? Really? Courageous. <laughs> and uh, Burkina Faso, Thomas Sankara. You should have given me that. I love him. <laughs> visionary, visionary. Constance, Holly Selassie. I don't know, trailblazer. <laughs> well, back to you. Liberia, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson. Pioneer. Andam, Idi Amin, Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said only positive? <laughs> I said not the words corrupt. <laughs> uh, Ugandan. <laughs> That's what I got. That's my word. <laughs> Okay, all right. So, uh, Constance, Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda. 
Oh my gosh, peacemaker, right? He fought for the freedom of all South, South and Central Africa. That's that's, that's what's up. <laughs> peacemaker. Yes. Adibola, Nigeria, Fumi Ransom Kuti. Ah, vibrator. <laughs> All right, you folks, um, it's been such a pleasure engaging with you all on African leadership and politics. For those that tuned in, thank you all so much. We're gonna go ahead and kick it back over to Amplify Africa and Tastemakers Africa. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Gillian, you were great. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.